because I've been traveling so much to these places where people live such different lives and they have such a different yeah, relationship to nature. And I think it's good to be aware that we are all connected, that the world is so huge and it's so different, but still we are all connected. And I really try to show that in my work, even though the cultural issues are totally different in all these different regions. Fordism. The joy of seeing and feeling tomorrow before it's been created. Continually challenging convention to push for certainty of a better experience when we get there. This is Forwardism. Hi everyone, my name is Yomi Adegake and welcome to This is Forwardism, an audio series by BMW for those who live for tomorrow today. In this series, I'll be talking to creative minds who are creating, shaping and designing our future. Together, me and my guests will be putting together a picture of the future whilst finding out what their definition of forwardism is and what it means to them. So who will be coming with us on our forwardism journey today? Well, today's guest is none other than Scarlett Hooft Krauflund, an artist and photographer. Scarlett travels the world creating surreal, dreamlike images in some of the most far-flung, isolated places on the earth, including the high-altitude salt flats in Bolivia, the beaches of Yemen, the polar region, and many, many more. Over the years, she's become an internationally acclaimed photographer with numerous exhibitions, prizes, and nominations. Her work has been exhibited in solo exhibitions all over Europe and as part of group shows at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, amongst others. She's also been working on a project with BMW, which we can't yet talk about, but do keep an eye out for it. Hi, Scarlett, and welcome to the podcast. Yes, thank you. It's lovely to be able to speak to you today. Yes. So for those who don't know about you and for those who want to know a bit more about you outside of the bio that I've just kind of discussed, um, what is something interesting that people might not know? What's a fun fact about Scarlett? I'm an artist and I use the world as my canvas and I'm very intrigued to go to places and to live for some time with uh, local communities and really get into that life. I love to spend quite some time, like weeks or months in these communities. And these are mainly really not westernized people. And um, yeah, I'm very uh, austere surroundings. And yeah, and I really love to live that way and to live more modest and to um, experience how they live their life close to nature and how they survive in these harsh environments. And that's shortly uh, who I am, I guess. (laughs) Yes. I mean, it's very, very interesting what you do. Um, And, you know, there is a lot that we'll be sort of unpacking later on. Um, So thank you so much for your description. Um, But I want to talk a little bit about the concept of forwardism um, because this podcast is called this is forwardism um so when you hear that phrase what springs to your mind how would you describe it in your own words yeah i was thinking about it i'm just trying to imagine like how life will be um like 20 years from now and how i will hopefully still work as an artist and still travel the world and yeah I just really hope that by that time nature has regained much of its freedom that it's more free of human interventions and pollution I really think that might be (laughs) the case and yeah I really hope that we will have more freedom also like borderless internet Mm. like all over the world and that's what I really imagining hmm. seeing the future. No, definitely. I think um, the environment has definitely come up a lot when we discuss forwardism on this podcast because you can't really think about the future. I think in this day and age, without thinking about the environment, our impact on it, and you know what that will look like in ten, twenty, fifty, hundred years from now. Yes, for sure. 
So given the podcast theme and the idea of Fordism, why do you think, in your humble opinion, we wanted to speak to you in terms of what is it about Fordism that you and your work embody? Well, I think because I've been traveling so much to these places where people live such different lives and they have such a different yeah, relationship to nature, I think. And that's also what I try to portray in my photographs or it's part of right. the subject matter I use. And I think it's good to be aware that we are all connected, that the world is so huge and it's so different, but still we are all connected. And I really try to show that in my work, even though the cultural issues are totally different in all these different regions. But I really try to position it in this very forceful nature, uh, this immense uh, freedom of nature, but also the contrast of the, the human, the customs of the local communities and how they cope and how... So I try always to place people like they're kind of small in the whole photograph. Right. So the nature is, is the most important part. And then there are uh, sometimes, yeah, people interventing. And I do like it to show that we're just part of it. And also how these rules or how these customs each culture has... It mm -hmm. might be a bit ridiculous if you place it in nature as if nature is commenting on it uh, while mm. putting it this way. Or that's what I'm trying to do, at least. Yeah, and, and maybe because it's in the Arctic, in the Bolivian highlands, in, in Madagascar, in, in Yemen, in China, it's all these different places. But still, I think there's something universal Absolutely. in these photos or that's at least what I hope to bring forward. You took the words from my mouth. <laughs> I was going to say there's certainly I would say a universality I hope that's a word um, to your work for sure that certainly reminds me as a viewer of just our tiny place in this ecosystem yeah. and how huge the world truly is and it's really incredible stuff so I'm very much looking forward to discussing that further in um, this conversation yeah. um, before I do. I think we've touched on it slightly, but I'm very interested in what drives you forward, what your sort of motivation is, because you've already kind of touched on in part about what you want viewers to sort of take away from your work. But what would you say provides that momentum? What's pushing you on? Yes. Well, I think I really always hope the photo has some magic in it and some mm. uplifting feeling. And I always hope people will get some joy out of it. But it's not only the joyful subjects I address, but still maybe it's easier to give an example. I made this photograph um, polar bear and it's a woman, naked woman sitting in a polar bear skin in the Arctic on a little uh, stairs. And this bear, it's almost like the same pasture as the Rodin uh, thinker um, sculpture. And mm. the air above it, the sky is very gray. It's really heavy. But then there is this naked leg a bit upwards. And so you have this big, big polar bear, uh, the skin, and it's sitting there. But then because of this naked foot, I think it gives you something uplifting, even though it's this sad position of the polar bear nowadays and, and with the climate mm. change. But then still, I think you also get a smile from it. Absolutely, because there's a level of, um, dare I say, sort of surrealism and there's an absurd kind of quality to the images that make them dreamlike. It doesn't feel, I think that's one of the descriptors that I've read of your work online. Yeah. And I think that's very accurate in the same way that Dali, you know, Dali's work feels like you're um, looking at a dream. I often feel the same sensation looking at your photographs where, you know, you've got these incredible backdrops, yeah. but there are elements inside it that do kind of pull a smile from you because they feel kind of almost yeah surreal mm. and it's what makes your work so singular and it's why you've attracted quite a lot of attention in recent years which is interesting because you didn't 
necessarily start out as a photographer. So I'd love to kind of hear a bit about yeah. your journey. How do you got here? Yes. Well, I'm trained as a sculptor. Um, right. I uh, studied sculpture first in the Netherlands and later in Jerusalem. And then I did my master's in sculpture in, in New York at Parsons School of Design. And it's actually in New York, I was always really working site specific. So responding to the situation of that site. And especially in New York, I was really thrilled by the yeah the history of the city, how it all started with the trade of uh, beaver skins and how this beaver, it almost got extinct at a certain point. And I really wanted to know more about it. And I, I became an, a member of a local uh, beaver association. And I really wanted to work together with beavers. So uh, I tried to let them know certain shapes in trees. And yeah, I did different things. So and by doing that, I always made photographs to document. And also right. I had picture frames and they cooperate this in their dam and so there were always these things and I would make photos of it and then I started to realize that those photos were the main yeah they became my artworks uh, in a way and yeah so I then started looking for um, yeah a good camera and a medium format camera and I had some photographer friends in New York who taught me some yeah how to work with it and so, yeah, little by little, it became my main uh, media. I still do some sculptural things as well, but photography is my main uh, topic now. And you um, you incorporate sculpture into your work, don't you, um, in your images at times? And I'm interested in terms of how that sort of came about. I mean, I guess, is that because you were documenting the sculptures originally? Yeah, I think I still uh, think as a sculptor. First, I want to make some kind of sculptural works mm. and then I make the photograph, but I never made documentary photography or was interested in that kind of thing. So sometimes installations, sometimes some kind of performances, but I always think as if it is sculpture. As we've discussed, you travel to incredible bucket list places that are, you know, many people may are unlikely to see in their lifetime if it's not through your images or the images of others. Um, lots of areas that are untouched and kind of remote. Um, and as you mentioned, communities that are often separate from the rest of the world, the rest of the Western world in particular. Yeah. And that's, you know, in the context of an increasingly digitalized, globalized, fast paced world, you're finding these communities and spaces that are very still. How difficult is it to find these places and is it getting um, harder <laughs> as time goes on and the world continues to connect? Uh, when I started like almost 20 years ago, I think um, it was much wow. more difficult because yeah, there was no internet. You could hardly communicate before. So you just went there and, and see what would happen. Yeah. And now sometimes it's still not possible because you need to know people. But I do think it's getting a bit more easy because, yeah, almost everywhere people are somewhat connected to Internet, even though they're not every day, but then they sometimes will check their Facebook account or something. Um, when I first went to the Inuit, that was, I think, in 96 or something, and um, I had a friend who who spent a lot of time there. So, and he gave me some names of friends of his. And so I had some connections, but still I arrived at a tiny airport with in an airplane with for six people and just came to this village. And, and then you know that there's only one plane every week and no hotels. Oh. And it's really a challenge, mm. but fortunately I had some names and I found some of these people and, and I could stay with somebody in their house. And But it is, um, it's really <laughs> kind of a gamble, but it's also great. I think it's such an adventure, you know, to try and see if it's possible and if they are open to, uh, yeah, to help me and, and if I can stay with these people. And, and um, 
And it's kind of beautiful that you only can write a letter by mail right. at that time. But I'm happy nowadays it's um, with internet. It's Yeah, it's probably a lot quicker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then I went to this island, Socotra in Yemen, and mm. I knew there was somebody who, she's a war photographer from Sana, and she studied at ICP in New York, uh, and she was staying there, and so I was trying to be in touch with her, but then they had for many days power cuts, so then it still it couldn't reach her, so I just decided to oh. go, and and I thought, well, I just hope I can find her there, and... Yeah, so these things, sometimes you also just have to, uh, you, yeah, you cannot plan. You just have to try and trust that it will be all right or something. Yeah, I mean, it seems to have been more than all right for 20 years. So I guess, you know, trust, <laughs> <laughs> trust the process. If it's not broken, don't fix it. But there's such variables involved. So you work um, with nature. Nature's hugely central to your work. Um, something that, you know, you can't control. You can plan around it to some degree, but it's very, you can't physically control the nature. Yeah. You work with um, people and communities. And, you know, again, it's out of your hands often in terms of how things might go. As you said, back in the day, especially you were kind of showing up and just hoping for the best. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in where that enthusiasm for the spontaneous and unplanned comes from. And would you say you work better when there's an element of surprise in your work or, you know, are you better with structure? Well, I wish I could plan it much better. I mean, it's it's so much <laughs> nicer to, you know, be prepared. It's just that in those places, it's many times too difficult and you don't know mm. what to expect. And yeah, you just have to find your way and to improvise and search. Yeah, it's so many times I, I've been staying with people in their houses and yeah, I learned so much from it. And also... You know, the fact that many times it's quite poor places, so there's there's mm. not that much. So you appreciate also more what you have and it's more unique in a way. Like here you're so used to just go to the supermarket and grab your food. And yeah, you appreciate it much more if you're then in a place where, where that is all not there, you know, that there's almost no stores and... And it's mm. also very difficult because, yeah, you're so much used to this Western world and, and being able to to use a mobile phone. And, and so things really slow down when you're in these places. You need a time and also, yeah, to find your way. And yeah, you need to write uh, moments for to make the photos. And so there's a lot of things that you're dependent on and then I still use analog photography so right. <laughs> that's another thing that makes <laughs> it slows down a little bit because you cannot check mm. but I really prefer to work that way and because I think somehow I can concentrate more when I know that I have not endless possibilities or yeah that I have just a certain amount of film rolls with me and mm. um, yeah I, I do like it to really have to get everything ready before you make that photo mm. I was personally amazed when I found out that you'd still shot on analog <laughs> which I'm gonna ask you about <laughs> in a little bit also um, I found that fascinating I would not have expected it just looking at the um images to be honest but I did mention that you know you have certain work such as um salt steps where that's you know I think it's it's a sculpture, correct me if I'm wrong, made from boats, yeah. I think. Um, right. Right? Yes. And um, I love those kind of images, which, again, I have that kind of like surreal quality of having, I suppose, a big expanse of space and then you yeah. know, something quite quirky in the middle. But my favourite images are the ones with people. Burka balloons, for instance, which, again, you know, the women in their burkas, I think it's on a sort of beach and they've got these like big blow up balloons with them. And again, it's that kind of... I don't know if there's a humour to it. There's a kind of turtle as well. With the, yeah. I think it's a, somebody with a turtle shell and you can see that the bum sort of poking out, yeah. <laughs> which is fun. And I'm interested in the people that you meet along the way because, um, you know, you've been to China, Bolivia, Madagascar, Oman, and you explore these relationships between people and traditions and nature. And I'm really interested in what kinds of people you're able to meet and what lessons you might have learned from um, them whilst travelling all this time. 
Yeah, I always try when I go to these places to meet with local artists because most of the time the people who are most open about my ideas. For example, when I was in Madagascar, I would travel uh, with some local photographers there and another artist. But it took me a long time to find these people because, yeah, I had almost Mm. no connections with Madagascar at all. So I just went there and I was kind of, you know, meeting people. And and on the end, yeah, it took me some time, but then I, I found some local guys and we rented a four-wheel truck and and we started traveling and I went back a couple of times and and it were these long, long travels. And it was really great because they would also do their own work. So we would stop and they would suddenly say, oh yeah, stop the car. And then they would do stuff for themselves. And and, But they told me stories about uh, legends or or things that was going on in Madagascar. And and that got me new ideas to to make things. And... um, and uh, for example, this turtle uh, you talked about, the the yeah. photo. Yeah, in Madagascar, it's, it's quite terrible the way, for example, the turtles are, well, they, they're selling the shields to tourists and it's yeah. declining uh, the, the turtle population. And so because I made already this work with the polar bear, it was me sitting in that skin. And so I thought I would sit oh. under this uh, shield of the turtle. Oh, so it's you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's me. Um, yeah. Um, so I was sitting naked under this shield of the turtle. And then this man who was helping me and um, I was staying with his family and his little daughter of four years old, she then was copying me <laughs> afterwards <laughs> and she was much better and and so so I made this photo of her and that was actually the, the right one and um, right. so these things just happen spontaneously because yeah. she was so much enjoying it and um, and yeah so that was great but yeah. that can only happen when you yeah when you really know the people I was there for a few months in total mm. and yeah you need that time to um also become friends and feel trusted and Mm. like that yeah I think that also shows the benefit of sometimes not planning because that sounded like a real moment of spontaneity that just created an incredible image yeah and I totally didn't expect her because but she liked it so much (laughs) and she came along uh, many times when we were doing photographs and so she was really into it and um, yeah that was great (laughs) it's a great image So obviously you've touched on the fact that you shoot analogue, which I think is fascinating given the outcome of your images. I'm interested in why that's the way you've chosen to shoot. And also, I suppose, what benefits shooting analogue has over, say, um, digital photography? Well, at first, you know, I just started off because at that time uh, that was the normal thing to do. But what I really think is the beauty of analog photography is that you don't manipulate, you know, that you make the photo, it's the negative and I still print from the negative. So it's kind of the real thing. And I like this pureness. Yeah, especially in this time where so much is, you know, all the advertisements are so much manipulated. And and mm. I do think the colors have such a, there's something different, especially I really love the dark blue in the sky. I many times have these big skies of blue and the blue of the analog is a bit different than the digital blue. But yeah, these are just things... Um, I don't know how much longer it's possible, but mm-hmm. it seems that there's still enough people using analog, but it's more difficult to find a lab and everything becomes much more expensive as well. The film mm-hmm. rolls and paper, everything. But I just like the beauty of it. And because it becomes more rare, I think it might be also more valuable in a way. Mm. No, definitely. I see the value in that. As I said, I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised. I think it's incredible that that you um you shoot analog, and I think it's interesting that, as you said, it's becoming slightly more difficult given the way photography and the technology around it has developed and changed over the years. So that brings me to my next question, which is, I suppose, about what you think the future of photography looks like. What 
developments and changes do you think we might see in your industry in the next few years? And um, how do you think your job might change in the next, you know, you've been doing it for 20 years. So what would it look like in 20 years time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's also really beautiful that this digital, um, it's so much developed and that there's such good quality. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I would think it will be mainly digital uh, in the future. I really hope, but I also think there will be still some labs doing uh, analog. And I heard that there's a new procedure for Polaroid. And also I notice in the art schools uh, more... Art students, they do like to um, experience with uh, analog photography. So I think there might be some in the future, but it will be mainly uh, digital, of course. Sometimes I, I have to do some assignments and then you need to have quick results. And mm. so then I do use digital, but I just... Mm. Really hope I can stick to my uh, working procedure the way I do now. Fingers crossed. I hope so too. <laughs> the results of, are amazing. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Yes. And it's interesting that you said, you know, whilst there is a broader shift and trend towards digital, that it feels like there hopefully will always be an audience and market for analog. When I think about my friends and when we go out, a lot of people actually, now you mention it, do... Yeah bring Polaroid cameras with them. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, hopefully that's something that sticks around. Yes. Um, so we are approaching the end of our episode, but before we go, I would like to ask you, especially as someone who has travelled extensively and to such envious locations, where you would like to go next and um, what your kind of, I guess, on your bucket list, what the next place you're really looking forward to capturing is. There are a lot of places I would like to go. For example, I, I really would like to go back to Yemen, but that's totally not uh, possible at the moment. But I am now working on a project. I try to use magic and I try to have this human figure to transcend in the landscape. I work with a local acrobat in Turkey, in the... Yeah, in a mountain area in central Turkey. Oh, can you tell us a little bit just about Turkey, just in terms of, because this is our slightly more, how would I say, descriptive area of the show where we like to sort of really get into our guests' minds. Um, so could you kind of tell me a little bit, as descriptively as possible, what about Turkey you're very much enjoying? Well, I really love this area, Cappadocia, this uh, amazing, very surreal landscapes of, of mountains that are very strange rock formations and it's mm. really countryside. And I also was doing stuff in, in the cotton fields, working with farmers and then this acrobat was doing stuff. Um, so it's a bit more... Uh, closer <laughs> by home but to me it's also quite beautiful to work there I, I'm living in, in Amsterdam and where there's a big Turkish community so it's oh, yeah. kind of nice to uh, some of these people I know from here they they mm. have family and they are helping me over there so it's it's Lovely. yeah kind of a logic uh, step to go there I think it sounds gorgeous I feel like I'm there I can practically see it <laughs> Thank you so much, Scarlett. Um, it's been a brilliant episode. It's been lovely to chat to you. I am sad to say to our listeners that today's episode is unfortunately already over, but we will push forward as always. So please do stay tuned for our next episode with another exciting creative mind. Until then, this is Forwardism. Forwardism.